How does anybody step into a role after they've been told they were promoted because they were a woman and then deliver for the first 90 days of their job, wondering where the target is on their back? Women cannot do it by ourselves. We need women and men to work together to create an equitable work environment for everybody. That's Suja Chandrasekharan and Diana McKenzie explaining gender diversity. They formed an organization called T200 to address this issue. T200 was formed from acknowledging women in tech is in record low numbers. Certainly there are systemic barriers created by headwinds and sometimes even tailwinds turn into headwinds. Suja Chandra, welcome to CXO Talk and please tell us about your work. I lead Digital and Tech as a Chief Digital and Information Officer at Common Spirit Health. We are a provider health system. We operate in 21 plus states and serve our communities across the care continuum. Uh, my background prior to this has been, I've been a technologist business leader at uh, retail and consumer focused industries. My marquee names that have been part of include Walmart, I was Global Chief Technology Officer at uh, Walmart. I was also, I led various leadership roles and led transformation at Nestle. And uh, prior to Common Spirit, I was at Kimberly Clark. I also sit on the board of American Eagle Outfitters, Bloom Global, which is a digital supply chain platform company, and Agendia Inc., where we focus on precision oncology with a specific emphasis around breast cancer, uh, women's health is a passion for me. I also spend time mentoring and developing others, and uh, we'll talk about that in the in the upcoming moments. Diana, let me introduce you and welcome you back to CXO Talk, and tell us about your work. I get the opportunity to serve on the boards of some uh, very exciting companies. And I'm doing um, a senior advisory role with a private equity company called Brighton Park Capital. And I also engage uh, quite frequently with uh, promising healthcare tech startups as an advisor and an investor that builds on 30 years of experiences in life sciences, primarily in technology roles. I spent the last nine years of my career in chief information officer roles, both at Amgen and at Workday. And um, right now, probably the most exciting thing about my life is that I get more time to um, focus on paying it forward, spend a lot of my time mentoring and advocating for women in technology and for people who live with uh, brain health conditions. You're both such uh, accomplished business leaders. And Suja, you started, and I believe Diana was involved from the beginning, an organization called T200 that is dedicated to supporting women in senior level business and technology roles. So tell us about T200. So around the 2015, 2016 timeframe, uh, the women in tech numbers were actually regressing since the 90s when I started my career. At that time, there were about 28% of uh, overall women in tech were, uh, overall people in tech were women. And uh, at that time, it was regressing below those numbers. And I may be off by here, here or there by a few points. And uh, the numbers are still poor. Uh, still about 37% of tech startups have only one woman director 58% of women are concerned about venture capital funding gap, and only 15% of CISO's chief information cyber officers are, uh, are women. So with this awareness, and, um, and also in general, there was a need for women and women to be helped to reach those next level roles. And, uh, and even just being, creating an environment of camaraderie where we can help each other uh, we lift each other. We provide transparency. Transparency is a prerequisite to equity. Transparency is a prerequisite to being able to present opportunity. There is a way you navigate career paths, and there is a way to teach people to do that. And and uh, so I, we started incubating this idea. Uh, what started as just a moment of inspiration got into then vetting the idea. What could this look like? Uh, not letting perfect be the enemy of progress. So just speaking with other women, like-minded women that are passionate as me, and then starting a group. 
So in the early days, it was just literally we three, four, five of us got together. It was a WhatsApp chat group. So we included uh, women into those uh, into that WhatsApp chat group. And we connected on various topics. Hey, what's going on? What are you doing here? There is this problem, cybersecurity issue. How are you addressing that? This talent situation. Uh, I need to prepare and present to my board. And, uh, and how are you approaching this particular topic? What questions to anticipate? How can we lift others? And so, and we grew and we set this uh, community up based on invitation only. So we do have a, a, a certain criteria that we are very rigorous about. And, uh, and, and then it grew, it five became 10. I literally remember those first few days with a last, la- last name like mine. It does take a little bit more influence and convincing of who this is, what's your agenda. Uh, so, and then we found, we found those women who are equally passionate in, in uh, giving to others as well as uh, receiving. And uh, and then we are now about 200, 200 plus, I would say. And we matriculated from a WhatsApp chat group to a Slack platform. Certainly the topics range a multitude of possibilities. Uh, helping each other is certainly paramount. We launched Lyft, which is about lifting other women, the next generation of women uh, who are at the sea level minus one, which Diana was very much part of that initiative and mentoring and developing women. We set ourselves goals. We're very goal-driven, mission-driven, principles-driven, purpose-driven, and goals-driven. Just like we bring the whole self of what we do at work, we bring it to T200, entirely voluntary. So it's a 501c3. Diana and I work very closely together to get it uh, registered as a not-for-profit. We have a formal board, and we both sit on the board along with a few other women. And uh, we are thriving. We are helping each other, which in itself is a great story. But we got together and lifting out the next generation is an even greater story. Diana, let me let me pose this to you. What is the fundamental challenge when it comes to women in senior leadership roles? These women um, having access to role models, advocates and mentors, um, if they don't have these, then it's it's increasingly challenging for them to have the transparency that Suja referenced earlier to understand what opportunities exist in the environment. Um, it's 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 challenging for them because they don't necessarily know and or appreciate the importance of building those external networks and ensuring that um, that while they're you know heads down doing what they're trying to do inside their company, they also understand what the broader context is for what they could be bringing to the company to drive to drive the business of the company. These unequal growth opportunities, um, you learn about you learn about those opportunities by engaging with networks. There's a, a misperception that women have that they must have all the skills. Um, before they apply for a job. And it's not a perception that's shared by many men. And so the opportunity to have someone who would actually advocate and sponsor for them and take the risk on them. And, you know, I'll give you a specific example. When I was a, uh, when I was a senior manager at Eli Lilly and Company, and there was a new director of architecture and strategy position had been formed, you know, there was a, I had a, a, a very uh, powerful, in, in my mind, mentor, advocate, who advocated for me to step into that role before I might have been or I might have been ready. And I would say the same thing uh, was the case for me when I stepped into the CIO role at Amgen. Bob Bradway recognized that I might not be ready, but advocated for me to take that role. And I will forever be grateful to those advocates for helping me take that next step. Contributing in a male-dominated setting um, and being heard is something that we hear a lot about women, um, and and it impacts their confidence if they don't they don't feel like they're being heard. And in reality, it may not have anything to do with whether they are being heard or not being heard, but the fact that they lack the context because the men that are in the room have a different context through the networks they participate in that the women don't. So this I, I can continue to come back to the the networking point as well. And I would say the the last thing that is a challenge just overall is, you know, 74% of young women express a desire for a STEM career, yet the reinforcement of that career opportunity fades such that by the time they get to a university, 
they don't choose those careers, or even if they apply to university, the admission requirements are so difficult that they're unable to bridge the gap. So I think there are a number of, of factors that play into this that 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 we as a as a community of leaders, both men and women, can help to address um, to grow the number of women in these senior leadership roles. Is this a bias issue? Is it an access to information issue? What's the what's going on? What are the dynamics at play here? Even if let's say there are some skills to be built, where do you focus on? We all grew up in different elements of the ladder. We play different roles. What skills to focus on? What leadership competencies to develop? And also, how do you tell those tell? How do you communicate those stories? And how do you communicate it in a way it resonates? Right, so the, this is a, a hiring a chief technology officer, hiring a chief digital officer. It's not easy for the CEOs and sometimes the boards. It is a role that it's a role that spans the entire spectrum of the company. Transformations are difficult. Change is always difficult, and so it's an equally challenging role for the C-suite and the board. So. For us to be able to teach and help women to make those connections, not just the network, but you are in a conversation. And how do you connect with a person you're speaking to in a way that you can tell what you have done and show the credibility of what you bring to the table? That is one thing we do fairly, fairly frequently. It's that perspective of lifting up, looking at your story of what you've accomplished, everything you've done, and then presenting it in a way it is relevant to that conversation. The, the other angle I would say is it's a double whammy when there are not enough of somebody in a particular role. So let's say there aren't enough women, in, in, to, even today it is, what, 18% of C-level uh, tech leaders, digital leaders, call it whatever, only 18% are women. So when you don't have enough, and then it, it's, the pyramid is sort of consistent. I would say you lead tech infra, the cloud, you wouldn't see a woman in a cloud data center for miles. So when you don't see enough, you can't believe in it. And, and that goes not just for the women who are aspiring, but it also goes to people that are hiring. So there is an element of turning around and telling these stories in, in forums like this and in other forums. So that is the believability so that when you look at a particular role, you can also envision a woman in that role. And this is a true story and it happened there was a group of people that went to an event and there was one woman, a token woman in that group and nobody believed she was an engineer. They thought she was there to take notes. So she started this woman in somewhere in the, somewhere in the nation, I forget where, she started this hashtag, I'm a woman engineer. So, I mean, just as it goes with an example of it goes both ways. One is that there are, if there aren't just enough role models what can women aspire to? But it also is enough of a, you don't see, if you, there isn't the believability. So we create that overall experience. And of course, the advocacy. Advocacy for each other, women lifting women, presenting them with the opportunities. Those are all very much necessary in order to address the access topic. When, when Suja and I met for the first time in, uh, I think it was 2019, um, you know, Suja had been on this journey with the T200 community to build T200. I had moved to the Bay Area in 2016 to take the role at Workday. And shortly after moving to that area, um, had the opportunity to start meeting some of the other technology leaders in the Bay Area. And I was surprised to find that quite a few of these leaders were women. And I was surprised because even when I was at Amgen and I would make trips to the Bay Area to attend the, the VC community gatherings for chief technology officers and information officers, or some of the larger software vendors' annual uh, customer meetings, I literally was one of two women in a sea of 40 men. And there wasn't any desire for that bias to exist. It just did because there was no network of women going to these events and therefore the men went and the women didn't. So 
That's what caused us to start the Silicon Valley Women's CIO Network. A couple of us said, this is just silly because there's so much that we can learn and also contribute in these events that will take us all back to our companies and, and make us better, make our teams better, make our companies better. And so it was when, when Suja and I met, we, we actually bridged those two groups. Um, and, and we still have the Silicon Valley Women's CIO Network with a very special set of relationships between now over 40 women. But many of these women are also part of T200. So that, that, that's one uh, story about bias. I think the second one is actually, if we take it up to 100,000 feet, there, there really is scarcely a company or an organization anywhere in the world that isn't undergoing some sort of transformation to become a more digital company, every company. So it's not just technology companies anymore. It's every company. And that, that pivot is creating incredible demand for these specialized roles that Suja referenced earlier, technology, product, data, cybersecurity, human-centered design. And on the boards on, on which I sit and the companies that I advise, one of the biggest challenges is hiring, filling all of their open jobs with the talent they need. And if we continue to limit the supply to a subset of the population that's out there and capable of contributing, not, not only will these companies not be able to compete and hit their goals, but it could be an existential threat, right, for their ability to survive and exist in this world that's becoming incre increasingly digital. And, and you think about then the social impact of companies in the healthcare and the financial services sector and the fact that they're adopting artificial intelligence and machine learning models over these large data sets. But we know that these, these data sets are inherently flawed because of the biases that are introduced because care delivery in the healthcare setting or the services that are delivered to populations have, have historically not included everyone from a diverse demographic. And so when we think about who better to solve those problems, ensure that the technology solutions that are being built in these companies are representative of the customer and stakeholder population, it's, it's just super important from a social impact perspective that we solve this problem, not, not just from a, you know, how, to, how do we make everybody feel good that we have good diverse representation in the company. And we have a very interesting question from Twitter, and this is from Arsalan Khan, who's a regular listener and asks such great questions. And so thank you for that, Arsalan. And he says this, Why, what do you think is the role of societal patriarchy that can affect women in technology and engineering. So he's wanting to know really about the, the, the broader social roots, the underlying context that enables this situation to exist and, and perpetuate. It certainly what we do at our homes with our children, boys and girls, what do we do with them plays a huge role. Right. So if you look at the history and a track record of any successful man or woman, they would always say they will quote a parent, a mother, father, a teacher, a mentor that they that they that they met in their younger ages. So that plays a huge role. My mother, for example, said you can be whatever you want. You can be you put you put your mind to it. Uh, you find what you're good at. You find what you enjoy and then you, you be the best of that. So. And, and she never stopped me, even though I was raised in India, which is generally a lot more patriarchal than other societies. I went to engineering school. I went to tech school and uh, I, I, I came through that path. But I, I was quite surprised sometimes when I come to the U.S. And, and this is a true story. A friend of ours, her daughter, uh, she went to she went to school in SoCal and uh, on the high school that she went to, her high school counselor uh, discourage her from doing a tech curriculum. Her high school teacher, this was, I'm talking 10 years back. I'm not talking like medieval ages. 10 years back, a girl, a girl, a, a teenage girl at that point was discouraged from doing that. And she picked her second best interest, which was Japanese. Language is always a great thing. It opens up new frontiers. All that is great. But her real passion was tech. So she ended up coming back into tech afterwards but she lost some wonderful years 
during the time when she could be spending time learning. And that kid is now an amazing software programmer. She works for a one of the large studios here in California. She's coding animation. She's sitting with software engineers. So she talk, calls me and talks to me and gets counsel from me. So yes, absolutely. Everybody plays a role. There is a fair amount of discouragement, both in my prior jobs, as well as even in general, I reach out to high school students. And it is important to grow, to catch the, the girls in their sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Those are very formative years. Show them the role models. So this is common knowledge when the uh, when the television serial uh, X-Files came about, there were a lot of uh, girls and women who became detectives. So how many role models do we have that are software engineers coding code in movies? Um, where, how, where are we seeing that women are stepping up and solving complex cybersecurity problems? Let's see that in society. Let's see that everywhere. Let's talk about that to girls and boys. And I'm not about neglecting our, our boy children or male children but it's certainly, it, necess- it is necessary that we encourage our women, our female children to focus and, and encourage them. And yeah, it is going to be hard. Okay, so heck yeah, we can solve it. We can address it. It is going to be a lot of work, but we can do it. And, uh, and surrounding them with those kinds of uh, environments so that they can thrive. So yes, absolutely. Families, societals, school environments, mentors, friends, everybody play a crucial role. Diana, picking up off of this, we have uh, another question from Twitter, and this is from Wayne Anderson, who says, companies like Microsoft, who do care intensely about overcoming bias, are having trouble getting candidates in many roles. What are we not doing? Do we need to invest in STEM and user groups, but today's roles, but it's very hard to hire people and i'll just i'll just comment that this is true for both men and women in general but still there is this perception that hey you know we want to hire a woman but we're not getting enough qualified candidates what about that i think the perception is reality i, I actually happen to have a son who is manages a technical recruiting group in tech as well and and we talk a lot about this i think if, if we go back to how suja answered the former question there is, there's no question, a pipeline challenge for us. In 1985, 37% of the computing degrees were women. Today, it's 18%. So that number has declined. So one of the opportunities for us is to focus on that, quite frankly, zero to, to K to 12 um, continuum to ensure that we're doing everything in our power, both men and women focused on women and and racial ethnic diversity as well in that pipeline to to attract these young people to technology careers. And I do think a big challenge that we faced through those years when the dot-com era was big, when there was a a sort of a a hacking mentality and a gaming mentality that came to engineering roles is it was difficult for women, young women to find a place there But in reality, I think we all know, Microsoft knows, that technology is a means to an end. So in essence, what we're really trying to do is solve business problems. And we're trying to do it creatively. And we, being a technologist gives you the tools to solve business problems in very creative and artistic ways. And I think if we can tell the story different to young women as they're coming through these earlier years of their schooling, to engage them, it it makes a big difference. I also think that where we are now, there's an opportunity to demonstrate, as you suggested, as a company, that there's a real commitment to creating a diverse workforce. And in doing so, the ability to attract and retain the talent that that you wanna have represented in your workforce increases. But in addition to that, there may be some other some other steps that can be taken. The first of those would be to ensure that all of the men inside the company, when we're talking about a gender specific issue, have a commitment to to mentor and advocate for a balanced slate of talent inside the company, men, women, racially diverse, et cetera. In addition to that, making sure that there's flexibility in how the networks are pulled together. How do teams gather outside of work? How do they gather inside of work? And in this new 
space of flex working, how do you make sure everybody has an opportunity to participate when we're working around work-life balance uh, uh, priorities? And then lastly, many companies are suspending the expectation or the requirement to hire someone with a degree. There are a number of technology positions that people can can apply for and contribute inside of company and start to work on their degree while they're there. There are also the opportunity to reskill employees that are already there who have an interest and an aptitude for technology. So there are multiple ways to get there, notwithstanding the fact that our pool right now is not as great as it needs to be. And that needs to be a priority for, for the nation. Suja, Diana was just describing the intention to create a balanced and diverse workforce. Beyond the intention, what should organizations be doing in order to make this happen and and address these issues? I'll start with a couple of stories. One is women do drop out of universities even after starting a tech path. So a colleague of mine, her daughter started in a BS engineering computer science And then she did the freshman year, she did the sophomore year, and then she gave up. It was too hard. She was not part of the groups that were working together for better grades. She didn't feel good. Her grades were slipping, so she dropped off. So we do, a pipeline problem has to be relentless, consistent, catching women where they are not starting in the line or they are dropping off the pipeline. So we have to create a very consistent mechanism in encouraging and watch out for those um, I will also tell in general that is a dearth for talent. And uh, this happened in my own family. One of my family member, a young kid, she came home for Thanksgiving and uh, she said she's been working 60 hour weeks for the last two years straight. She was taking the first weekend off and then her boss called and said, you have to work, get back to work. The kid was sitting there crying and I went and spoke to her and find out why are you crying? And she said, I hadn't taken a day off. And uh, I was working 60 hours every day the last two years through COVID. And then I was going to take the first time I was going to take a day off during Thanksgiving. And I can't because I have to get back to work. So I said, it'll be fine. I calmed her down. She got her work done. And then she she went. And then she looked for a job for a couple of weeks. She quit the previous job, which is with one of the blue chip large companies. I I don't want to name them. And she went and now she's coding autonomous vehicles with another company. I'm a top-notch software engineer. So this is happening around everybody. This is not just a a woman thing. We have to watch out. When I probed a little bit deeper with her, what happened? Why do you have to work so hard? Nobody should be doing that. And don't you, aren't your teammates working? What what exactly is happening? And she said that there have been open headcounts and they haven't filled it for two years. And this is one of the richest multi-trillion valuation company. So it, this is a tough situation and we need to help everybody lift up. So what have we done practically? I believe in setting very clear goals. So we were at Common Spirit Health. We had, uh, we had to hire quite a few people. So we've hired 500 plus people in the last couple of years. And um, we gave ourselves a goal that we should meet a goal of say, 30% of women and people of diversity. So it was both. It was not just women, it was women and, and people of diversity and 30%. And it's interesting when you when you set these goals, there is different perspectives and all perspectives are valid, but it's in, it, interesting to read those patterns. There was a group that said, are we, are we stupid? How are we going to get the goals that are not 30% women to get the goals that aren't 30% women that are going to be available? And then the other group said, Why 30%? It should be 50%. When did you look around the society? 50% of of us are women. So I knew I wasn't going to win that game, but I said, you know what? We need to set 30%. We'll see where we get. It was not easy, but I give great credit to my organization. We achieved 40% of our new hires were women and people of diverse backgrounds. 40%. So when we did that, now we have amped up our goal. It is at least 40%. And, and the subsequent hiring needs to be even further, even far than that. Now I'm in healthcare. 
And health tech is in the even interesting situation, right? There is a general challenge, general challenge uh, for women in tech. I mean, healthcare is even more of a tougher environment because of the hours, because of, uh, and especially in COVID in the front line of the battle. So we have to work two times as hard to, to make this happen. Um, there was a comment that's floating around, which I thought would be good to share with you all. Diversity just doesn't happen because you talk about numbers. When the leader practices diversity, inclusion and belonging follows instinctively. So the whole continuum of the belonging, the whole continuum of being included, the whole continuum of access, you hire in the 10, 15 years back, very easy to find one person, one woman in a group, very easy to find one person of color in a group because it was the tokenization of checking the box and counting a number. But certainly today, the focus is around diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging, and access. And that continuum is what is needed, not just to bring in people, but also to keep them there. Because without that access, they're not going to thrive. Without that sense of belonging gives a clarity. I live this. I go into a room and I'm the only woman in the room or only person of color. It, it, it creates a mental dissonance and it takes it you have to gather yourself a little bit more to be fully present in that in that event and you practice it and you get better at it but people who are just pushed into those environments you they, we have to help them the environment needs to be accepting and belonging and and then accept the diversity of perspectives that they bring it's not it's not about just bringing someone because it's it's nice to have that box checked but when they say something different, women tend to be a lot more nurturing and caring. Women tend to be a lot more focused on people. I put people first. And when women do that, then focus on that, hear that. It definitely, there is a meaning and a larger purpose to it than just the morality of it. The morality is important, not any less, but there is a clear economic value because ultimately it's in the diversity of those perspectives that the right decisions come about. So give them the space to speak. Give them, give your voice a place. And, uh, and those are the, those are some of the tips I would offer, Michael. And we have another question coming in from Twitter. You can see I prioritize the questions that come in from the audience. They're always great questions. And this is from Emma McDonald, who's picking up on something you both discussed a little bit earlier. And she's saying, uh, can, can you comment on the impact to a woman's career progression related to working from home over these last two years that, that, and that you guys have discussed and it's been in the press recently? Suja, I'll pick up and then you can, you can, uh, you can build. Um, you know, the, the most recent statistic is that the quit rate, if you will, for women in tech roles in 2021 was 53%, which just continues to build on this conversation we've been having. Because they they were at home, their children, if they had children, were also at home, and they were trying to manage the work and the school schedules. And in many cases, mom and dad were both at home or you know, mother and their partner were at home and trying to manage the children. And so it was a challenge for, for, for everyone, but it demonstrated itself in terms of statistics more for the women. I think the benefit now, as we emerge from the pandemic and we're seeing companies embrace more flexible working conditions, is we have an opportunity to go someplace that we weren't necessarily able to go before from a flexibility standpoint. So there, there are women who are able to get up in the morning, take their kids to school, work, go pick their kids up from school, and then get back on at night. Um, and, and having that additional flexibility in their calendar addresses some of the challenges that caused a number of them to, to, to back away. I think to your point, the question about inclusion is a question not only for women, but it's also a question for anybody that is going to spend the vast majority of their time working from home when there are people in the office and the two have to interact with each other. And there is this element of intentionality that Suju was referencing earlier that flows through this entire conversation all the way back to the paternalistic question that we got. And that is, if the success of your company and your ability to compete is dependent upon the quality of the talent you have in your workplace, and your goal is to engage that talent 
retain that talent, develop that talent, then as a leadership team, you have to do everything in your power to make sure you're creating an environment that engages and and, uh, promotes inclusiveness. And it's a very different way of operating than many, many companies operated prior to the pandemic. And I think there are a lot of companies that still figuring it out. But ultimately, it comes down to the role the manager plays in ensuring that they're creating an inclusive environment for their team, regardless of whether they're working from home, they're working from inside the office, and or they represent gender or racial diversity. I think ultimately, we have to ask the question, what should companies be doing? Three things. And not it's, it's on the, definitely on the organizations, but it's also up to the individuals. But I would, here is what I mean by that. I don't believe the playbooks of the work from home, the hybrid work environment, the playbooks have not been shaped and clear yet. They're not clear yet. I think it is evolving and we are going to be learning over the next several months and years. Tools and technologies are better, but they need to mature and emerge in a much farther way. And that we are all part of shaping that industry also. So action for managers, creating that environment, creating that rich environment, examples, chat groups, water cooler conversations have completely stopped. So create those informal chat groups, Um, create informal environments so people can come and thrive, create an equity, equitable work environment, create opportunities to work asynchronously. Um, So what it takes in your specific company situation so that Everybody can be included, and in particular, the women can take advantage of it. To Dinah's point, women have been lopsidedly impacted because typically they have been the caregivers for the young age as well as the senior caregiving is also with the women. So give them that space, create the environment, and that is for the organizations and the environment to prepare and produce. Now, as an individual, we also have a role to play. To the, to the person who brought up that question, I laud her for asking that question because she's reflecting on it, she's thinking about it. And, and two things happened. One is through the work from home, one, the introverts started thriving because a lot of it is on chat and that is an element of not being able to speak up, but I am okay to think about my sentence and put it on chat. Whereas in a meeting, an extrovert or people who generally tend to speak, they take over the conversations So people could leverage and take advantage of some of the modalities that introverts and women tend to be a little bit more on the introverted side and and they can, especially women in tech, so they can start taking advantage of those. But thinking through influence techniques, every individual needs to do that. How I influence, how I engage with my peers, how I engage with my leaders, how I engage with my organization, what do I need to do? Engaging with the networks was much easier when you just went on a conference and you grabbed coffee with someone, you had a meal with someone, you just waved to someone, you gave them a casual hug on the way between conference sessions. Those are all gone. So when you're doing that on Zoom, it is even more intentionality to create that similar networking environment. To some people, it actually can be an advantage because if you see social media, the introverts started getting engaged a lot on social media in general 10 years back. So in, intentionally thinking through individuals' influence mechanisms, all things considered where we are is also up to the individual as well. I'm sure there's a lot of coaching and teaching that can be done. But I will finish where I said that, Michael. I don't think the playbooks are written yet. We are all learning. I'm personally, I worry a lot about my organization and uh, am I doing enough? So I, I, I think we have to think about it and talk about it and create that more. What should women do when they observe bias in the workplace? I'm going to share a story about when this happened with me and and how I handled it. I think that the first thing any woman needs to do is take a step back and seek to understand what just happened. It doesn't mean that, that it wasn't intentional bias, but trying to understand first sort of allows the perspective to then say, you know, as I approached the person that, that generated the bias or said that the sexually harassing remark, were they aware of how that landed on me? Were they aware that that wasn't acceptable? And ultimately, can we get, can we get to closure on that so that I can see if it's going to happen again? And then if it doesn't happen again, we sort of circle back to the conversation we've been having is, 
hey, this environment may, may not be an environment that truly values diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there are so many environments out there that are emphasizing this right now. Maybe the right place for me to be is in one of those environments. What I'll say is when I was very first promoted to director, and I referenced that earlier, um, our CIO at the time was getting a lot of pressure from the executive management of the company that he didn't have enough women on his leadership team. And so I was told by the HR executive director that I was given the promotion because I was a woman and that all of my peers, male, had some of them had some concerns about my promotion and they had been given 90 days to schedule time with me to tell me what their concern was. How does anybody step into a role after they've been told they were promoted because they were a woman and then deliver for the first 90 days of their job, wondering where the target is on their back? So I had that conversation with the HR director and I said, I am not waiting 90 days. And within the next week, I scheduled one-on-ones with every single one of my new peers and had a conversation with them asking for open, candid feedback about what their concerns were about my ability to perform in this role. And ultimately, there were some, there's no question, there was, there were feedback and observations for me in terms of how I how I participated, influenced, et cetera. But ultimately, I ended up being exceedingly successful in the role. And some of these individuals that I worked with at the time, I continue to stay very connected to in my network. So I, I think at the outset, allowing, allowing a bad situation. To, to, to take things in a more negative direction without trying to address it head on, um, you're missing the opportunity to potentially educate and improve the environment for other women. Suja, we're just about out of time. So very quickly, what can men do? The, every woman will tell you there were, there were men along the way that helped and lifted them. So the allyship, the kinship, the understanding of the circumstances, the willingness to reach and, and lift them, and many men come to us and say, hey, my mom was a big uh, player in my life. I have my daughter. I worry about my two daughters. I want them to have role models. So give them confidence. Women generally tend to be low in confidence. There's a beautiful book called Confidence Code. So give them confidence. Be the cheerleaders. Don't call them emotional. Watch out for the biases that Diana talked about. You can be their sponsor or advocate. Women cannot do it by ourselves. We need women and men to work together to create an equitable work environment for everybody. Unfortunately, we're out of time. A huge thank you to Suja Chandra and to Diana McKenzie. Thank you both so much for taking time to be here today. I really, really am grateful to you. Michael, thank thank you. It was a pleasure. Suja, always a pleasure. Everybody, thank you for watching. Before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our newsletter. Tell a friend. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have amazing shows coming up. You really should subscribe to the newsletter. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.